Okay. Hello, everyone. We're going to start. It's a little a little after seven, and um, and the parents have arrived, so <laughs> we can we can start in. Um, I'm Megan Marshall, and I was really honored to be invited by Heather to introduce the, these two poets tonight. Um, I've only just met Sarah Giragosian, but I know Heather Tressler quite well, and I've seen what a gift she has for friendship, forming connections that enrich the lives and work of all concerned. As Heather wrote in her essay, which is in this book back there, an essay, Poems as Paintings, life drawing in words collected in the craft anthology marbles on the floor how to assemble a book of poems edited by sarah and virginia conchin um, heather wrote an artist can be starved of more than food i believe heather's friendship with sarah which began five years ago in the bishop archive at vassar is one of these sustaining connections and its flowering is evident in the program tonight I'll introduce um, both of the poets um, at the beginning and in the order in which they're going to read. So first we have Sarah Giragosian, a poet and critic living in Schenectady, New York. She's the author of the poetry collections Queer Fish, a winner of the American Poetry Journal Book Prize in 2017 and The Death Spiral of 2020. She co-edited the craft anthology I mentioned, Marbles on the Floor, uh, for the University of Akron Press. Her poems and creative nonfiction have recently appeared in such journals as Orion, Ecotone, The Missouri Review, Prairie Schooner, Tin House, and Terrain. And her honors include a fellowship from the NEH, a fellowship from the Vermont Studio Center, and inclusion in the 2016 and 2018 Best of the Net anthology. She teaches in the Department of Writing and Critical Inquiry Sounds like a very interesting department. Um, and English at the University of Albany, SUNY. Heather Tressler, our local poet of the night, I guess you're both though from Massachusetts, um, is the author of Parturition, which won the Chapbook Award from the Munster Literature Center in Ireland and the Jean Pedrick Award from the New England Poetry Club in 2020. Her poems appear in the Irish Times, American Scholar, Cincinnati Review, Harvard Review, PN Review, and the Iowa Review, among others. And her essays appear in eight books about contemporary poetry, as well as in the Los Angeles Review of Books and Boston Review. In 2021, Spencer Reese chose her poem, Wildlife, for the W.B. Yeats Prize. And her sequence of poems, The Lucy Odes, received the Editor's Prize from the Missouri Review in 2019. She is professor of English at Worcester State University and a resident scholar at the Brandeis Women's Studies Center, Research Center. So we'll start with Sarah and I'm gonna stand in the back because I have back trouble. So anyone who wants one of these seats that was reserved up here could take it if they want. <laughs> Hi, everyone. Um, Megan, thank you so much for that introduction. I'm still glowing. I'm so excited to meet uh, Megan Marshall and um, so many poets and scholars that I, I admire tonight. I feel like I'm coming full circle. I uh, went to grad school at Boston University and I would pass the girl year and I would just be in awe. <laughs> and uh, so it's just it's such an honor to be here tonight and to be reading with my friends and colleague Heather Tressler, uh, whose poetry I greatly admire. Um, thank you, Heather. So um, I'll start with a new poem. Um, this is a time when I, I feel like I really need to believe in small miracles. And this is a poem about my volunteer work as a wildlife rehabber. Um, I've helped to rehab raptors, birds of prey. And um, this is one of those poems that seems almost too neat, too perfect for a poem, but I, I swear it really happens. Um, so it's called The Release. Tossed up like a handful of confetti, she, Redtail, is elbowed off like a bride to the wild. But she reels and staggers, flies low, a tumult of wings daring height. Quiver flight, girdle of flight, girdle of light flight, 
anxious flight, flight of reckoning, of three month rehabilitation, should been deemed release ready. But I wonder what landmines have settled in her mind, which are exploding now. We hope the late spring sun will hail her, beckon her back to sky, that she'll remember this park where we found her wounded and return to fluent flyer again. But for all we know, the sun's dazzle could be a knife point to her eyes and the out of the blue freedom, another kind of extraction. Perhaps the world shivers, blusters her in its sudden sharpness. The last time you wandered off a subway onto the streets of a foreign city, what signs did you fail to follow? A familiar maple might be an anchor for a moment, but soon Jays arrive, strafing and screaming at her, and she has forgotten her own powers, counterpoint of attack, swift beak to belly. Maybe only higher gods can mend trauma's corrosions of the mind. Maybe the pages of the world flip too quickly or the text runs backwards, and she is still just a juvenile, slurring the geometry as a flight, then teetering from limb to limb. Maybe there's no mercy believable for this age of nuclear fallout and mass extinction, but reader, believe me, nature's dos ex machina in the form of a mature red-tailed hawk, her mother, did appear, exploding from the treetops to defend her, scattering the jays like loose change. Who could have foreseen it? And who could have foreseen another hawk sliding in from the east as if part of the family? Who could have foreseen daughter reunited with parents, the rhyme of their bodies a ballast, her hawkness restored? So it's true that um, Juvenile Hawk did reunite with her parents that, that day, which is exciting to see. Um, this is called Gift of Ammonite. I lose my way again in a chamber of ammonite, fossilized helix, a blink of an eye in time that dizzies my mind back to an ancient seabed, to eons of embedment, heat, and pressure, to this casting of carbonized spiral in my palm. Every crenulation, every coil and excursion into Earth's memory. Listen, if you dip your ear to the bend of the ocean floor, you can hear the Earth humming. If you tilt this whirl of stone to the whirl of your ear, you can hear evolution's queer refrains. Its tweaks and adjustments scale to the frequency of tadpole shrimp, jellyfish, nautilus, and dreams. Listen for ruptures in time signature. Wait the way you waited for her love to arrive. Um, and this is Taconic Falls Haibon. This is a, a waterfall in New York. Um, I had the, uh, the pleasure to, to um, have a residency in Ithaca, New York. And so I wrote many high buns during that period, which I think are um, wonderful exercises when uh, you're traveling. So Taconic Falls high bun. Here, the theater of bird shadows against cliff face with its infinite joints and fractures heightens the catharsis of waterfall. In this former sea, a stratigrapher's dream, turkey vultures play ring around the rosy with my body while a crow riffs off the echoes of his cause against the gorge. I pause in this sejora in earth, while from the watchtower of slick rock, hundreds of feet above, an agile bird, a peregrine? No, here they were wiped out with DDT, contemplates her next nosedive. Maybe a hawk? State your wonderlust and call your mother. She cat, cat, cacks. It's been weeks. Translate this lithic extravagance this pre-rain scent and kettle warm slag. If you're brave enough, work in the memento mori of your species, the fumes and plastics that will be read in the strata by some future race. Mention to the love letter that is tucked into the same nook where vultures split their time with sky. Breathe in pine and brush up against deep time, swoon under their spell. And take note of the once nomadic ribbon waving from a crack in a spinal cord column of limestone. When a breeze knocks loose a spark shower of rocks, watch how red cedars cling on for dear life in the nick of time. Um, so lots of poems about rocks and stones. Um, I'll read from my, my first collection, Queer Fish, which um, I call a queer bestiary. Um, we know that um, Queer relations, queer configurations of, of being exist in the animal kingdom, hundreds of species, 
uh, demonstrate those relations. And this is kind of an ode to, I guess you could call the, the misfits of the animal kingdom. Mm. To the meerkat. This wrapped bandit-eyed mother, scorpion diner and foe to cobras is not a marauder, but rather the obverse, upright and slightly simian on her miniature mongoose legs. Love is like the sole lookout, the one who reconnoiters the desert to keep her clan unharmed. Dear Totem, she telegraphs her cry across the wasteland. If any slinking or winged thing nears, although her clamant alarm gives her away. Love's swift and costly here, and she, banisher of loneliness, leans in close, dainty nose grazing ear, to groom another's fur just so. And this is when the horseshoe crab grieves. Dying, I confide in starfish and lightning. The stones, twittering distantly, speak to me. The rain in our open graves is a temporary relief. And from underneath the echo chamber of my shell, I hear a soft moaning and dream of the new moon I cannot see. We speak of the flung togetherness of our lives how the slapping tide can turn us like dice and the fishnets frilled with carry-on strings bind us, translucent lobes of jellyfish, dangling crabs and twisted cordage of seaweed. All of us know the swift feedback of pain, even the armored ones like me. Now the gulls that would knock all day against the steel pan of my carapace hesitate and watch from their freezy angle. We are all poison and poisoned, slick with oil and its rings of dark pearl. I wear a black veil of seaweed. Flies, those thieves of blood, do not know to stay away. Everywhere along the shore, we cry for love and the sweeping arms of a green sea. Um, and I'll end this collection with um, my last poem, The Fish Beneath the Portuguese Man of War. So of course we know the Portuguese man of war is toxic, but there are fish that live um, underneath the Portuguese man of war and are safe under um, the tentacles of the Portuguese man of war. They're unharmed by the, uh, the poison of the Portuguese man of war. Although the inverted crown squiring snarls of tentacles laced with poison trawls for prey and goes winding, winding down into the gloom like Escher stairs, I flutter beneath the curtain of singers, wristless to me. Tide thrust polyps propel me forward like stewards of my will. And I trail their colony, not a self, that balloons an amethyst bladder above the sea line while the tentacles clan goes fishing, hovering like fringe around my fins. In sleep, safe in the perimeter of their reach, I drift eastwards, following a gas-filled moon. I'll just read a couple more poems. Um, this is from my collection, The Death Spiral, um, which I know is a cheery title. Um, <laughs> but this was written during the, um, the years of the Trump administration. Um, okay, so let me start. Bear with me for a second as I find the page. Um, so maybe you've heard of the science of de-extinction, um, but there are scientists who um, are exploring the idea of resurrecting extinct animals like the mammoth. Um, so this poem is called Mammoth Resurrected. Before my birth, father was more than fossil. Pickled in tundra, he still had his undercoat of grizzle, teeth, and a knee broken and folded in tighter than a jackknife. When they found him as perfect as the day the sinkhole followed him, they dreamed me up. Am I extinct? No, called back, claimed the minds that made me, coaxing DNA from father's bones and toying with mother's genome to invent a new sequence for me. Poached from another eon and implanted in her womb, swaying in time with her elephant strides, 
I grew for mother's coos and breakneck science. My tusk nubs scuffed her insides, outscaling her womb too soon and stretching her be belly cruelly. And when I arrived late, I knew that mother who scraped her tongue against my hump and raked her tongue through my wool was mapping my flesh like ancestral land. She tested the length of me, making touch memory. Entrusted with my soft spots and whimpers, baby dents and outdated ridges, she, with elephant tact, had no choice but to love me, more grand aunt than offspring, captor and taboo. I kept below the soft flaps of her breasts and in the first hungers of infancy, I drank in the millennial air, choked on the seepage of benzene, mercury and the musk of men before my mouth found her teeth. I'll just read one last poem. Um, this is called Wasp, Wasp Nest. I hear them in my dreams. Their wings beat at a frequency of sea and out of spittle, wood and song, they make a cathedral of paper mache. It grows each hour, a Gothic fruit below the sweet birch while they writhe in a fever of toil, laying comb upon comb, feeding their larva, fine tuning their hive, sounding their pain to fem female industry throughout the streets. When I approach, no intrude, it is not pain that I crave, but something close to it. Her, the queen of meticulous care and fierce motherhood, whose madness is formalized and made into a fortress. I would be a pincushion to her singer, but instead she clutches me as an eclipse. Six little claws, six little legs. Pillars of wasps rise and fall away like gates when she comes. And when she coaxes me through, I will become her initiate, just as someday a hive of sleepers will pupate and rise from their combs, such formal cells form a new brood. There is venom here. I cannot forget it, but nothing reckless. There is pattern and her vision and life, a future in every nurtured crevice. Thank you so much. Just checking the door. I think my colleague's roommate has been haunting. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you very much. Thank you for coming. Um, there's so many people here to thank tonight. Um, and I'll start with my dear friend, Megan Marshall, who got me through the pandemic in two really sort of marvelous and complimentary ways. One was while everyone else was um, reading Tolstoy, I uh, <laughs> couldn't quite stomach that, but um, very happily reread Megan's three biographies. Um, I started with the Peabody Sisters, which is just a wonderfully, it's of course meticulous historical scholarship, but it's also just this incredible soap opera about three siblings um, growing up in a rambunctious um, uh, family and being one of four, it was, it was just what I wanted to read. Um, and then of course I moved on to um, her two other incredible biographies, um, um, our biography of Margaret Fuller, which won the Pulitzer. And then of course her marvelous biography of Elizabeth Bishop, which was how I first met uh, Megan. Um, in fact, I feel as though Bishop is sort of the phantom presence in the room here tonight, as I also met um, Sarah in the Bishop archive six years ago when we were comparing notes on various um, Bishop poems and Bishop letters and Bishop trivia. Um, uh, and it's Elizabeth Bishop that I have to thank for many of the friendships in this room, including uh, with Lloyd Schwartz and, and, and um, by extension, David Stang and Gail Mazur, who is uh, Zooming in tonight. Um, tonight, I'll be reading uh, just a couple of poems from uh, my little chapbook, Parturition, which came out just as the world was closing down. Um, 
three years ago, uh, virtually through the day. Um, but I'll also be trying out some new poems um, that are from a manuscript that's sitting as we speak with a contest judge uh, mm -hmm. uh, to perhaps invoke the higher gods, as Sarah called them. Um, and it's really a pleasure and an honor to follow Sarah, whose metaphysical vision, um, her understanding of geologic time, her use of the ocean and the sky, uh, regularly just makes me feel like Grandma Moses, you know, just kind of getting, getting through um, figure by figure uh, next to her work. Um, the poems in this new manuscript, uh, which is titled Auguries and Divinations, um, a kind of lofty title for an atheist, um, has sort of maybe three or four through lines. And one of them is mothers. And um, I'll, I'll begin sort of with this poem, which is the first poem in the manuscript. Uh, there's an homage, of course, to, um, to Elizabeth Bishop, uh, which she'll hear. Um, and also to my mother, who's um, certainly the muse of, of this book. Um, it's called purpura, which is the Latin term for purple. When the poet wrote, I lost my mother's watch, we knew she meant more than a timepiece. To watch over the soft skulled expulsive being that is baby is a genre of love that must break its own clock. In my first years, I slept little. When I slept, I left my eyes garage doors open. Poor mother sought, baby awake, mother awake. For months, staring contests in the half dark, calling each other's bluff, falling in love as any pair must with desire and jealousy, jostling furniture in the psyche, heady hormonal rush. When I lost my mother's watch, I was 13, the day unaccountably bright. Fields of flora bloomed under her skin as if she were the lavender hat in Surratt's famed painting. An ambulance rolled its orange glass eye at her strange beauty. For weeks, we waited for her body to lose Lose its artistic ambition, toxic drugs, confusion. Doctors asked, who is president? What year is it? Can you name your children? Purpura, the broken blood vessels in her skin's pointless painting. Some code or augury to read and remember. I watched, thinking of Phoenicians finding the world's costliest color in the crushed bodies of murex, vats of pulverized mollusks, to trim the general's cloak, to dye the emperor's robe purple. What a tyrant or daughter claims as her right, calling it nature. The first empire is mother. Um, the focus of this uh, new collection is sort of unabashedly about the lives of women. Um, uh, I remember being in college with, with my dear friend Emily McMains, reading Alice Munro as a freshman and um, realizing somewhat belatedly that the interior lives of women could be, could be the subject of, of great work. Um, uh, which was a revelation. Um, I'll read this one uh, poem that's set in the MFA. Um, it's called Egyptian Wing. And I, and I feel um, obliged to mention that my mother is extremely healthy and is with us now. Um, uh, uh, and has been a fantastic mother, so. Egyptian Wing. Lost in the museum on Saturdays in the wine dark rooms of Egyptian tombs because my mother had a disorder of the blood and no one could tell me anything I could believe of death. Her bed raised high as an ancient altar of stone worn by a priest's blade. 
There she lay cordoned off beyond touch, like a carved artifact the centuries have filigreed with hairline fissures of light. I was told to pray to the poor man who hung, lashed to his lumber, his ribs a staircase to a face of agony, strangely cleansed of terror. This was no God to save a mother. Whereas the Egyptians had followed a creed of birds, even the tomb was called an egg. And while mummy an accident of sound, not sense, there was tender swaddling in death clothes, each body bathed in Nile salt and stuffed with fragrant spices, organs parsed in canopic jars like the grammar, subject, predicate of a sentence. To be sent off as if to summer camp with pets and snacks and details for care and handling for that afterlife. I prayed to falcon-headed Horus, wear of Ka, soul of the heart. Weren't birds commuting between a bitter earth and sky, making an eros of pitched precision, mothering a small body toward its horizon? Um, I'm going to read a couple of lighter poems, um, including one that I know Lloyd likes. Um, uh, it's called cul-de-sac and, um, I, I have never lived on a cul-de-sac, nor do any of the figures in the poem bear any resemblance to known persons or to any members of my family. Um, but it is sort of about the creepy suburbs. And, um, I shared this poem with Gail Mazur, who told me, uh, I didn't know this before I gave it to her. She very, uh, kindly, I don't think took offense that she grew up in a cul-de-sac and um, uh, that something like what is described in the poem actually happened in her neighborhood, so. Mm. Cul-de-sac. That old rage for order. How father drove a square mouth mower over and back, over and back, each row of neatly trimmed grass, cut just like he told his barber, boy short, regular. Oh, pioneer, taming this joke bit of prairie, no bindweed or dog shit on his verdure. Mother, meanwhile, absolved counters of crumbs, paired two dozen socks to matching mates, hummed some half-remembered Sinatra song as she dusted the porcelain figurines and never used quaintly painted china plates. In the antic business of having nice things, an obligation of display, a furnishing. Each squat house in our streets orb eyed the other, envious of another's paint job, carport or owner. Left alone, I built model planes with torn pocket parachutes, rode a blue scooter in dizzying loops of the prescribed circle. Adults acted as if living here were preferred or exalted, but I had looked it up. I knew it meant bottom of the sack, the fate of drowned cats, a sickly child or rabbit, gathered up, held head down in a satchel or bucket. When the hands closed in, I'd make a run for it. Um, I'll read one other poem that I know Lloyd likes. Uh, it's it's um, titled Wildlife. And um, uh, I sometimes think that while Sarah is definitely um, covering the territory where it comes to raptors, maybe I'll write about the songbirds and the, the humble turkeys um, who took over my neighborhood during the pandemic. And it coincided, of course, with the last presidential election. So there were parallels. <laughs> All struts and gibbering, waddles and caruncles, palm turkeys parade at dusk, panoply of feathers fanned, snoods engorged and dangling over their sharpened beaks while their heads turn from red to white to blue, in tricolor blush, 
pulsing placards above their sexual taxis. Hens loitering in shade, raise acorns and the occasional grub, an eye cocked, nonplussed. They've seen this all before. Ben Franklin thought the fowl vain and silly, but respectable, more American than the thieving eagle. Hens sense that courtship, like government, rarely is as dainty as ballet of bowerbirds. And of the preening toms, who hasn't felt the need to wear a brighter face for love or war? At dusk, they flock to the wooded edge of town and mate quietly on ground. Then one by one take running starts, wings pumping, and like battered 747s, ascend to perch on spiky feet, nestling along limbs longer than their own. Small miracle, how they vault their 20 pounds of pulse in air, as after a day of too many hours, uphill the last set of stairs. Galliforms, sharp-sighted by day, are night-blind prey. My predator is my dark. After love, I too sleep on a second story. They're really better than Charlie Chaplin when they're doing their mm -hmm. nocturnal scene. Um, I'm going to read just a couple of poems about or that pertain to sort of local history. Um, and I, I'm indebted to Megan for correcting a few historical inaccuracies I had in the poem originally. Um, but this is about Sophia Peabody, um, who married Nathaniel Hawthorne. Um, and their romance sort of called her out of a long spell of sort of chronic illness um, that she'd experienced as a, a child and as a teenager. Um, and in their first year of marriage, they lived at the old manse in Concord, um, where Thoreau planted uh, for them their first vegetable garden. And Sophia, I should also say, um, was a marvelous uh, artist in her own right, um, a very talented painter and sculptor. Sophia Hawthorne. Ecstasy, from the Greek to stand outside oneself, as the painter gazing at her subject slips from her body as in moments of extremis, great pain or pleasure, when a door falls open and the soul hurriedly departs. I had always wished to leave. For years, I thought I'd perish in my mother's house, a pitied invalid, bled and leached, dosed with mercury and opium, a case beyond all cure. Then my sister's friend, Hawthorne appeared in our dim parlor, and my soul met its adamant, a quartz to debride my flesh of the tiresome troubles of family. Father who never made enough money, my sisters who taught school for our rent, bread, and honey, our hapless brothers want to guzzle and gamble, flirt and cavort, while mother fretted in endless prayer high-minded lamentation. How dreary, this perpetual earning to eat and mate, mother and suffer. I yearned to make, so I did. First paintings, landscapes and likenesses, then sculptures of busts and medallions. I trained my eye in the alchemy of oils, my hand for the rigor, of quarried stone. Already an author, an author, Hawthorne parsed the shadows of a Saturnine home. Like me, he abhorred the day's slop and grind, the endless commerce. Doubtful as Thomas, he yearned to craft an earthly beauty, and he did not see me as the runt, the sickly Peabody, but as an artist and as a woman, no less, 
To the taper of never spoken hopes he brought flame, heat and kindling of a man's heart intent on its obtain against the riddle of my daily pain, headaches that blotted out sun, sound and sense, he pledged desire, a sympathy better than any tincture. I studied the blush that crept across his brow in parlor tris, the light skitter over the dark lakes of his eyes. At night, I conjured the smell of ink and leather, the gentleness with which he took my hand. Yet we would have no marriage and no hearth until we found the old manse. Nestled in that sunlit house by the banks of Concord River, we strode across the broad fields where men sowed blood and ardor for freedom that private wish might be the only king. One night after he coaxed me to stand outside myself to let the last door fall open, I took the ring that he had lent my hand and carved our names into a window pane with two truths. Man's accidents are God's purposes and, and an image granted to my painter's eye the smallest twig leans clear against the sky. And you can actually find that inscription in the windows on the second floor of, of Old Manse. Um, I'll say too quickly as, a, as an end note, she never got to sculpt actual stone. So um, thus the, the prepositional hedging there that she trained her hand for um, quarried stone, although she didn't managed to, to carve it, as far as we know, I think. Um, I'll read just a, a couple more poems. Um, this is a, a short one. It's called First Grief, and it's again about the Hawthorns um, in their first year of marriage. Um, and it does also sort of take place at Old Manse. And they were, um, they sort of met later than most couples. So um, that's another piece of information. Late to love, still to marriage, they assumed little, having foraged for each other. So even as the sign seemed clear and Sophia's courses stopped, they knew the danger in forecasts, the whims of wind and weather, and spoke little of their gathered hope. So when she slipped from the stalwart arm of her beloved and fell hard against the frozen face of Concord River, she tried not to regard the basket of blood as more than accident. Freak fall, a first loss, requiring of them yet more tenderness and a stern reminder in newlywed bliss of dark currents that swell and course beneath gray ice, how a sudden crack in winter's river devours as quick as any storied tragedy. What had begun in a sweet flood of four limbs pulsing blood and a narrow bed swum as if black water. Okay. Um, I think I will read this. I don't want to abuse my time or your, your good patience. Um, I'm going to read just two more. Um, and this is from a new project, um, apart from the manuscript uh, that I think is done. Um, and um, it's called Self-Portrait is Venice. Uh, so this is a little bit longer, but then it's followed by a very short one. Um, and uh, uh, member of the audience, uh, my friend David Stang was sort of a fellow traveler in mid-pandemic orthopedic surgery, uh, not of our choosing. Um, and this is called Self-Portrait as Venice. To rebuild the small city of the body takes more than the designated Tuesday that surgeon and patient arise before daybreak and attend to the soaps and special rinses 
For the appointed meeting, more planned than tryst, more grim than truce, this laying down not of arms or for ardor, but in the strangest specie of love, staged under hallied lights and a flimsy anonymous robe and nubby paper underwear. You ink an X where the skin will be dyed a halting shade of orange for abrasion. You gown for the occasion. I chose the person I asked to slit my throat with more care than I would priest or mechanic, knowing he or she must be both. And I asked for release from pain I had learned signaled danger. I asked that it not be an abattoir, but theater, not a sacrament, but the intimate science of delicate instruments rendered at precise angles with studied degrees of pressure. A door cut through the throat to the Doric column of spine, its capital slipped, threatening to shear the bridge to the aging city that teemed with the news and startle of invited intrusion. Narrow canals of blood and bustling avenues of nerves, suddenly full of jockeying gondolas and jocular parades, while territories of tough fascia and boglands of adipose required stubborn navigation, not to mention each region's upstart mayor and gun-proud militia, each organ a bossy bureaucrat, believing itself more important than the others, obedient only to the winged lion who paws a book in the central square. Into the unruly city, I asked you to venture as a foreign minister to restore a column of order never mistaken for ornamental, to chisel what had splintered without dimming the lights or necessary appliances, to repair what ordinary fidelity and gravity had cost a floating city over tides, over time. A year later, I hinge at the gym on a Roman chair, coaxing strength into the spinal suburbs. When pulling up, I glimpse in the dim mirror, the long pale scar scrawled like an autograph on a token souvenir. What telegraphs? that you will hear. Um, I'm going to send us off into the evening with uh, hopefully sort of a lullaby of a poem. Um, if you'll go back with me into 1953-ish, um, and a street in Metro Boston called Chase Street. This is, this is I promise, the last one. Um, and it's a poem about matrilineal inheritances and um, the perhaps unrivaled love between mother and child. Childhood, that cold planet warmed by women and my mother's childhood, it's unspeakable fear, meteors, astral glare. Among early memories, watching from her bed by the back window, as a clatter of crows shrieked and flapped madly, settling into a jostling line along the phone wire. Before she learned the word omen, she knew dark birds gathering like a storm of vitriol, startled without warning from the green water of the trees. She counted them like wooden beads on an abacus or rosary and listened for nightly bells that rang from the spire, sharp enough to pierce the fevered skin of sunset. A sexton levering the ropes of sky with the pendulum of his body. A man with hossers in need of a ship, his belled song dead reckoning for land ahead, land of night's hungers, the day's offices, locked by those who carry the keys. I go back to her childhood, the child and her watchful birth by the window, the train's long hydraulic sigh into the station as the figure of her father made his way uphill in a suit, having left his bloodied tools and shirt to an autoclave and boiled laundry. 
He could remember the map of any mouth, its carious glitch, its pattern of gnaw, its record of appetite and wear, its tongue's compass rose, the cavity of mouth making its mute confession to the priest of drill and hand mirror, auditor to what a body will not, cannot tell itself. So the child listens for his whistle, studies his stride, the door's spin of its latch, her mother's hallway greeting held out like a stiff semaphore for night weather, fair or foul, sober or unbottled. There is hidden song in the mother's voice, promising a dash for door and keys. Infant hands steady their grip on the mast of the bed. Is it vestigial, my trust in second story windows, lookouts, hideaways, a getaway car, or this need to tally birds and bells, catalog the signs? Rhyme at a photo of us in a summer field, my cheek against her chest, my face scowled in scorn for what would pull me from that embrace, its trap door to a warm planet of women with its bounty of rain and daughtered sun, its seance of science, its memory, hers and mine. Somewhere, a sexton peels chords of evensong, as crows clamor for carrion, and a figure of malice or affection strides uphill, while a silhouette bends over a bed to claim what is hers on Chase Street. Thank you. So Sarah and I will field any questions, comments, tomatoes, vetoes. <laughs> that was dazzling, Heather. Oh, as was yours. Yeah. And to think we met sort of scrutinizing Bishop's handwriting. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Which Lord knows so well. In its degrees of legibility. Yeah. Megan, yes. Say a little something about that time of the archives, uh, working on Bishop and how that uh, kind of found its way into the work since then. Sure. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. The, our work in the archives was just astonishing. Um, I had studied Bishop for many years uh, as a grad student, um, but getting to work with her materials firsthand. Um, was really remarkable. Um, I think, you know, one of the things that I admire, one of many of, one of the many things I admire about Bishop is her tenderness um, mm -hmm. and her metaphorical imagination. I think um, thinking about her influence on my more recent work, um, you know, I just, I love the way that Bishop shows the mind in motion, um, the way that she, qualifies herself um, often through, um, you know, more precise images or through a kind of um, cognitive refinement. And I think my, I think my, my style has become a little more relaxed and a little more sensitive to, um, bless you, to the um, flux and thought and the kind of motion um, that we mm. see in, in Bishop's poems. Um, thematically, I'm, I'm really drawn to Bishop's um, environmental consciousness and her social consciousness. And um, I mean, I think that has been an influence for many years. Um, but I just, I had a, I think a sense of Bishop as, you know, not just a poet, but also as a friend and a colleague working in the archives and um, working alongside Heather, um, whose work is phenomenal. Um, uh, Heather is a remarkable Bishop Scholar, um, has also just been inspiring and animated my own work in so many ways. Oh, um, 
Yes, to all those things. <laughs> um, Bishop sort of staged a benign guerrilla overtake of my dissertation. Um, it was probably one of the best things that ever happened to me. Um, and I didn't know, of course, in choosing to work on her work, that it would also sort of be a, a kind of lodestar to meeting some really other uh, amazing thinkers and writers. And the fellowship that we both had, it was um, it was in 2017. Mm -hmm. And it was sort of a mixture of scholars at various stages and poets and critics. And so it was really, it was really great to kind of have that petty stew. And we were all living in Vassar dorms and there's like nothing quite as bonding as being in your thirties or forties and having to confront a dorm bed again. So we were all sort of like moving like zombies first thing in the morning into the, into the archive. But then once the coffee got going and, and we dug in, it was really, um, it was really great and really wonderful to have um, a portrait of of Bishop as a as a friend and colleague, mm -hmm. and um, uh, you know all of the relationships that um, she was actively cultivating and and keeping up with. Um, that was that was really inspiring to see. Um, my students often have this idea of you know the poet as solitary artist. Like, oh no 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 no! <laughs> you know, <laughs> poets come in in gangs. You know, they come in in cohorts and they. They help each other um, get better and, and hear each other. Mm -hmm. And um, finding a, a reader in Sarah, Sarah is like wonderful with these sort of very gentle critiques. And um, uh, uh, you know, it's not quite done yet. Um, comments that help me kind of keep going. Mm -hmm. So it's a great question, Megan. Thank you. Um, spirit of Bishop is all around. Yeah, and I think what was remarkable too is that there really wasn't competition when we were um, at the archives. There really was a sense of collaboration and um, just mutual awe <laughs> for Bishop. And so, um, yeah, it was a unique experience. Sometimes residencies and conventions are don't have that spirit of collaboration and friendship. And I think that one did. Yes. Oh, for sure. For sure. We would have coffee each morning. Um, one of the nice things about having money from the NEH was that there was like a, a really nice coffee brunch every morning. And so we would come out of the archives and refuel on coffee and sort of talk about what we had just found. And that was really, I mean, it was like being in a joint archaeological dig. Mm -hmm. It was really a very different archival experience than mm -hmm. I'd ever had. Um, it's usually pretty solitary. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, other, yeah, go ahead. I'm not going to pronounce it the way you correctly pronounce it, the everybody's name, but um, what led you to doing an examination of her life and, and your response poetically to what you wanted? Um, Megan's book, which is fabulous. Um, I just have one sister, but I can almost imagine having two. And um, and Elizabeth and Sophia and um, gosh, I'm forgetting the third sister's name. Mary? Uh, and Mary, yes, thank you. Um, they had they all, were all sort of incredibly important movers in the transcendentalist movement. And until Bishop's book, I think largely unsung. Um, and Sophia's ambitions were so lofty, um, and her. You know, she, you know, Nathaniel was initially friends with Elizabeth Peabody, and um, there's some intimation that Elizabeth may have fancied Nathaniel, um, but the moment Nathaniel sort of met Sophia, um, it was all over, so to speak, you know, uh, the choice was clear. And I think the story of two artists um, and very unique temperaments finding themselves um, sort of slightly beyond or far beyond the age at which, you know, matrimony typically happened in the 19th century. It was just a, it was a sort of a wonderful portrait of artistic temperaments coming together and, um, and just, I don't know, I love a good rom-com, you know. <laughs> um, but great question. Yeah, I really. Actually, you have this wonderful book uh, that Sarah edited and whenever you're the same marbles on the floor, um, how to assemble a book of poems. 
I'm just wondering about how you, you know, in terms of distilling some of the wisdom in it about creating a book of poems, what, um, what have you two learned about the narrative arts and you know, from creating your own poems, uh, your own books? Um, you know, what, what are some, what's some wisdom about putting your poems together in some meaningful way? Um, well, there are 12 essays. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I think we could probably each come up with a handful of takeaways. Um, you know, I think poets' procedures for organizing books um, can be everything from sort of tossing the, the collection down a flight of stairs and seeing what happens to um, sort of more strategic looking for ways in which poems can have conversations with each other. Um, for me, and just assembling this first chapbook, I was thinking, um, trying to think, I'm not a visual artist, but I love visual art and I love thinking about galleries and how curators strategically um, orient viewers through a collection. Um, I went back to Horace's um, famous letter to the Pisos in which he articulates the connection between poetry and visual art. And one of the things that Horace emphasizes in that um, is that you want to force the reader gently enough, I guess, into having varied perspectives on the work at hand and to try to keep that dynamic um, vital and lively um, as the, the reader progresses through the collection. So big landscape paintings, small intaglios, you know, sort of forcing that perspective change in the viewer. And um, John Berryman had said something similar in a somewhat um, playful way. He said, you know, you have to basically spin the reader around, around backward and clonk them on the head, you know? <laughs> um, it needn't be concussive perhaps, but, um, but that thinking about it in that way helped me kind of get out of strict narrative, strict chronology, a sense of their building toward a denouement, like all of the narrative strategies that, um, I think we often import. Um, yeah, I mean, I think like Elizabeth Bishop, Heather is a wonderful interdisciplinary thinker. And the way that you were thinking about um, assembling a poetry manuscript as being akin to curating paintings, curating art, um, was really exciting to see. Um, you know, I, I think in my own, process, I was not as really conscious of the many strategies that can be used uh, to organize a poetry manuscript as I was after reading, editing the manuscript. Um, as Heather mentioned, there can be aleatory strategies, um, strategies that involve getting really physical with the manuscripts, um, thinking about it in terms of collage. Um, and um, you know, all of the the contributors to the anthology just um, have, you know, a range of backgrounds and experiences in poetry and with other arts that, that inform the manuscript. And I think what's exciting is that it's not, it's an anthology that's not just about craft and technique. Uh, a lot of the poets in that anthology were thinking about their own poetic legacies, um, thinking about um, kind of the the foundations of their own poetics. And so, um, yeah, you you don't wanna miss Heather's essay. Um, it's just, it's so beautiful. And um, Heather's visual imagination, uh, her metaphors are just so riveting. And I think you can see that featured in, in that particular essay. Thank you. And thank you for the plug. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> the whole collection is really great, tons, yeah. So this question for you, Heather, you have a phrase in one of your poems, better than any tincture, mm. which I was struck by the musicality of the, the trophy at either end of that phrase and mm. the repetition of the A-N sound in the middle of it. Mm. And I just wondered if that kind of thing is something that just, just falls into your, you know, out, out of your mind, into your pen. Or is it something that you 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 consciously maneuver musical values like that? Ah, oh, thank you, Tom, for asking that question. Um, uh, Ever since college, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> 
the really wonderful and dangerous part of having someone in the room who's known you since you're 18 and has been reading your poems since you're 18 and being very generous with my terrible collegiate poetry, um, all of which I hope is safely buried. Um, but um, I think I've always been driven by mouthfeel and sonics and music. And someone asked me recently, you know, are you a formalist? And I said, um, fallen formalist, probably sort of more of like a Suzuki um, formalist, you know, I'm not really interested per se in, in tending to or keeping fidelity with strict meter or rhyme, but I really wanted to, to feel good in the mouth and good in the ear. And so um, anyone who's ever shared an apartment with me, um, you know, they hear me talking to myself a lot. And so just <laughs> reading this stuff out loud a, a, a good bit. Um, but um, but that Sophia Hawthorne poem, it may not be done, you know. Um, I'm with Frank Bedart and believing that, you know, so many poems that make it into on the page or into publication for me um, take take an excess of 40 or 50 drafts, you know. Um, it's just a really, for me, it's been a really long process. Um, my college students don't want to hear this. <laughs> I, you know, I say, I say some things that to them might be a little depressing, like it may take you 20 years to write the poem you want to write. Um, which is something that, um, my own collegiate mentor, Michael Harper used to say to me, um, uh, which both infuriated me at the time and, taught me to be, I guess, more patient with the, the long process, the long game, as it were. Um, Sarah also has wonderful, both sonics and visual qualities. I sort of feel like I read a Sarah Gear Goshen poem and, and sort of really see things differently. Think about time in a much more elastic and a much less quotidian way. I mean, I'm always sort of thinking like, is it 415? And Sarah's <laughs> thinking like, about the Anthropocene and you know <laughs> like um so it's it's really really wonderful to, to sort of step inside her geologic time thank you yeah I mean I I feel like a lot of the, the poems that I read tonight are um kind of short squat little poems but hearing your long narrative poems um just is really inspiring I feel like I can, I've learned so much from you about how to handle profluence and to extend metaphors. A lot of my long narrative poems become more like essays and I'm still learning how to avoid exposition. And I think that um, just hearing some of these no, new poems, the way that you're handling sonance and metaphor, um, they're just ex exquisite. And, uh, you know, I, I feel like um, I'm learning so much from you as a colleague. Oh, yeah. Likewise. Mm -hmm. And now that we've written our mutual Valentine's. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> um, but I will say too, just on that point, you know, Sarah and I, I think came up, Sarah is a bit younger than I am, but we came up when, um, when I was in college, language poetry was really mm -hmm. cool. And I went to these readings and thought, what in the hell? Like these poets are just <laughs> like uulating, you know, this, this isn't really, this isn't a poem, you know, you can't do anything with this. And um, I think I sort of retreated in some ways into to working with um, the great late Michael Harper, who taught me that poems could be about history and could be about world events and could be a really vital space in which to think through things and of space in which narrative could live. And um, that was not cool for all of the aughts, <laughs> virtually. <laughs> Um, and I think our sort of more ancient need for poetry and what we go to for poetry um, historically over time has kind of maybe come back into vogue. Mm -hmm. um, so the Luddites ride again. <laughs> um, yeah, and we need music. And I think that, um, you know, I, I sometimes find that the language poets are are not sensitive to the the voice aspect of poetry. And, and yet a lot of these poets, I think that we're mutually interested in, um, consider discontinuity and, and fracture um, in ways that are um, perhaps 
as exciting or more exciting than like lyric poets, but um, are contending with lyric subjectivity differently um, with the music, <laughs> which is important to me. So yeah, I think we have um, certain affinity in our tastes. Definitely. Yeah. Yeah. So kids, if you're watching at home, <laughs> you can be both postmodern and <laughs> and Horatian. <laughs> Okay, cool. We'll probably conclude there. Thank you so much for coming out. And um, thank you, uh, many, many thanks to James Frazier, the manager extraordinaire of the Girl Year, and to Carol Minkiti, who's been keeping the vision of the Girl Year alive and vital. And thank you all for checking out here on a really nice spring day and spring night. Um, yeah, thanks again. <laughs>